uh, in the roadmap we can see uh, which which nations yes. will be represented, yes, yes. not necessarily which operators or uh, so yeah, take us through those. Yeah, yeah, indeed, we're, we're keeping uh, some information a little bit secret, but uh, this year and after Australia, so Burnt Horizon, we're doing uh, uh, secret services uh, the US as well as Denmark. Then in season three, we're flying to Peru and Mexico, so uh, South American uh, vibe here. And finally, we're finishing with India and Kenya. Excellent. So those are the seven different nations, uh, operator identities uh, uh, that will be revealed during the year. And how are those countries chosen? Is there anything anything specific behind it? Are you looking at the players? Or it's a little bit. Uh, it, it's a mix of different factors. Um, there's uh, obviously the fantasy, the lore, and or the part of. Uh, um, uh, part of a testament to the realism of the game, right? Ideally, that, that is a country that has some form of an armed force uh, that, is, that is, for instance, famous. Uh, and then, obviously, there's uh, gaming new territories. It's always cool to add a new country, I feel, rather than revisiting the same one. So we, we go in different locations, and that's a, that's a good message, I feel, for Rainbow Six. And indeed, sometimes we have seen, it was the case for Japan, was the case for Brazil in the first year, countries or regions that are reacting so positively about seeing their content uh, that all of a sudden we see the player base uh, growing uh, uh, very much, or activating uh, much more than what they did previously. So sometimes there are those guesses like, oh, okay, maybe this country will, will, will start seeing more players there. So it's a, it's a mix of all of these reasons. What about ideas of um, of limiting the, the difference in rank between players who can play together. So maybe someone who is copper can't play with a platinum or change the matchmaking system, just tweak it a little bit so that if you have three platinums and two coppers playing together, they still get matched at platinum level rather than coming down to gold. Are those ideas you would consider looking at at all? We have a team that's looking at all of the matchmaking parameters and as you know, that's always that balance where you want to trade between the uh, speed of the matchmaking and the faster you want it, the wider you need the criteria to be and the precision or let's say the quality of the ranking. So there's different approach it to it and clearly I don't believe that we have found the perfect balance and perfect recipe and maybe we should be tightening a little bit the criteria so that we reduce the range towards which uh, people are getting matchmaked but that comes with the cost and especially the higher level uh, ranking you go the smaller the population is, meaning also the uh, matchmaking time is longer. So it's always that trade, and it's not. A de it can't be a definitive answer and solution because from region to region, the population also can, and, and time to time even, uh, population uh, available for matchmaking change a lot. Uh, so what? good for a region at a special timing may not be good for another region at another timing so it's not as simple uh, uh, as this uh, but i think you're right that uh, dedicating attention and 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 more into how we bring matchmaking to a slightly more qualitative level is something uh, i would like to do okay. um, this is going to be a lot about reworking maps we're seeing three map reworks so there's canal cafe do you know the third one theme park, theme park. Yes. yep that's the last one it's it's on the roadmap for the whole year uh, that's presented that the during the panel and it's in the video uh, as well so it's uh, it's safe okay that's good to know that, that's actually that's a really yeah. interesting one to look at mm, yeah. oh yeah <laughs> maybe i can get your take as well on the friendly fire change yep. So this is going into the test server at some point within the this season, yes, season yeah. one. And then the goal is to first put it into casual, and will it ever be considered for ranked, or is ranked just off limits at all? It's not definitive whatsoever, and that's the main goal of test test server is actually getting a good, uh, large player feedback and, and data so that we actually make uh, educated decisions, right? So uh, there's nothing definitive if, even to its deployment, uh, likely indeed. I believe it's going to go through several uh, iterations, but all of the different criteria has the original design where you know you can shoot a friendly, you're getting worn, and only if you take him down then you come in reverse friendly fire, so that's only the second one where you take the damage is that not 
uh, uh, restricted enough. Like, uh, I'm, so we're going to be tweaking with those parameters as well as uh, 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 other measures on top of it, uh, like for give systems, because we believe it's important that if there is a mistake, then all of a sudden there's a way for player and people to say, hey man, it's okay, it was unintentional, so we can retract this. All of those systems are going to be coming separately, uh, uh, step by step. Uh, that's part of uh, our development philosophy uh, as much as possible. And the deployment question is going to be coming uh, with all of this. I think we're going to be seeing uh, the populations reacting to the test servers in ways where that's going to educate us. Shall we put it there? Yes, no. So uh, we'll see when, uh, when timing is right and when the design is more final. Yeah, because I mean, I suppose one of the concerns is that it could kind of shift the risk from yes, of course. the player who's actually shooting does, to the... It does change the risk, 100%, of course. That's a, the exact intention, is this? Of course, yes, but I think maybe if someone is trying to play legitimately, yes. um, normally now, if I'm running in front of my friend, I'm risking my life. Yep. In future, maybe, if I'm running in front of my friend, I'm risking his life. Yep, very much. I know. So that's an interesting I know, of course. change. Uh, it is, uh, as mentioned, it is a part of different measures, because Team Kid is... Uh, uh, is a complex uh, behavior to tackle and to try to uh, uh, to nerf uh, because, as you mentioned, it, it taps into one of the core mechanics of the game, which is the lethality and the, and the friendly fire. So you want to keep the friendly fire because it's, uh, it's, it's tension, it's how people do care about where they aim and how they aim and how they shoot, sorry. But, but at the same time, okay, we need to address that issue. Team kill is the abs one of the biggest cancer we have in the game. Let's be honest, how many, probably countless uh, uh, games you've been having where you spawn in the game, you're getting shoot, you're out. Likely, because that's the issue we, have, we observe, team kill is the first domino that then triggers uh, all of all of other toxic behaviors i'm getting team kill what do i do likely i leave the game mm -hmm. so now it's a 4v5 that triggers potentially someone else to become that wasn't toxic before to become toxic because hey now why why on earth would i be even playing so i'm, I'm doing the same or i'm becoming a, a more toxic so we need to address absolutely that uh, that issue and we'll do it in the most uh, respectful way with the the game and and what we intended uh, first. And will this replace the kick system that we have right now? Right now you do two kill kills, you're out. You, you leave the match, right? You're kicked out of the match. Uh, technically, where uh, the, the uh, friendly fire will be deployed, then the kick system that uh, is not necessary uh, anymore. Because uh, the, after the first kill, you, you are the one taking the damage, so you are sort of kicking yourself out. And uh, again, I think it's important, uh, um, and I understand the necessity of all of the granularity, because it's a super important point, keep in mind, test server first, likely iterations, so if I'm giving you all of those details, it can change. Uh, and it's cool, because that's actually the test of people playing it and feedbacking that's going to be the right uh, the right way of, uh, of getting and, and addressing and tweaking that, uh, that feature. There's a question about the long-term future of Rainbow Six. We currently have 44 operators, yes. I think. So we're missing 56 to yeah. get to 100. Yeah. That's seven years. Yeah. So <laughs> what happens to Rainbow Six if Sony and Microsoft release new consoles in I, those seven years? We. Uh, as a general philosophy, I can tell you what's our approach. Our approach is this is a game that's uh, based on a community and you don't want to fragment a community. That was the same core principle when we decided not to have any single map being a, D a payable DLC because every content like a map, like a playlist or like a console that comes out, it's a new fragmentation of your, uh, of your player base. Um, we sincerely hope that the next generation of console will, as much as possible, support games that are building big communities, whether they are backward compatible or allowing some form of a crossplay, right? And if that's the case, and for us, we see next console ideally as, hey, it's an upgrade of your PC, right? So we should be able to play, and I hope we'll be able to play, but you have questions for Microsoft and Sony, not me, yeah. uh, uh, with, with the rest of the generation. I think whether it's games like Rainbow Six and there are others, like in the past year or two, that are actually building huge amount of people, they will not allow a segregation of the community. It makes no sense 
why would you accept part of your current population to go in a, in a, in a fully isolated and segregated uh, ecosystem that makes no sense and I think the council have already uh, uh, taken that information allowing cross play that's the first step within like hey you know what let's break the boundaries so I'm, I'm and that's not again um, at all my decision uh, so uh, uh, don't uh, don't count myself uh, responsible for this but I, I'm very hopeful that uh, the future will hold uh, uh, no boundary gameplay and no boundary games between councils uh, really Okay, uh, so that is a little bit of a risk because you are depending on Microsoft yep. and Sony. Okay. Yes. Yep. It's a risk that we are willing to take uh, when you have today uh, that that big of a population in the in, in your current ecosystem. Uh, but I can tell you the philosophy yes. of what we believe, like uh, non-segregation, uh, absolutely, uh, of course, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are countless games uh, that are, uh, even though I understand it's PC and PC only, but I, I, I do trust, uh, considering the, long, the current landscape of, of gaming, that cannot be a sustainable solution if uh, manufacturers keep on segregating communities, 100%. I mean, sort of what we've seen up until now is that the consoles are still the main platform for Rainbow Six, more than PC. More players are maybe switching, but do you, do you have any information? The, the pace as to of, of acquiring and conversion of players is much higher on PC than it is now on consoles. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much again.